This is going to be Hebrews chapter 4, verse by verse. And we're going to look at the topic of effects of the written word. When a man finds a genuine and sincere interest in the word of God, it will have an effect on him. And the words that come out of your mouth are not just words coming out of your mouth. It shows what's in your heart. It shows your thoughts. And your thoughts aren't just thoughts. Your thoughts are part of your brain. Uh, the Bible is God's mind. And, I mean, His words are His thoughts. The greatest thing you can do is let God give you a piece of His mind. That's what you're getting when you read the Bible. Also, something to note about this chapter is that it talks about four different rests. One of them is the rest when God rested from His work on the seventh day. One of them is the rest of the promised land of Canaan. The third one is the believer's rest. And then the millennial rest. So if you're a born-again Christian, then you entered into the believer's rest at the moment of salvation. And every believer should get into the written word of God every day of their life. It will have some effect on them. It will cause you to fear. That's the first thing I'm going to look at. It will cause you to fear. Hebrews 4.1 Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left of us entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. So the born-again believer has already entered into his rest. So this rest can't be the believer's rest because every born-again Christian will also enter into the millennial kingdom no matter what. So this can't be applied doctrinally to a born-again believer in the church age. It says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left, of, left, uh, left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. So it has to be referring to a tribulation saint entering into the millennial kingdom. He should fear God and his word so that he doesn't come short of entering into the millennial rest. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. While we don't doctrinally apply Hebrews 4, 1 to ourselves, the entire Bible is still for us. We can still get something out of this verse to apply to ourselves practically. That is, fear God if you want to rest in your Christian life on this earth. As a Christian, your soul is sinless, but your flesh is full of sin. For you to enter the promised land of rest in your Christian life, you have to beat down the flesh. You're saved eternally, no matter what. But if you live for the Lord on this earth while you're here, you will have the peace of God. Philippians 4, 7 says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. So what can keep you living right? Fear. If you realize that God will chasten you for doing wrong, then you'll be less likely to do something you aren't supposed to be doing. The more you read the Bible, the more you will fear God. It shows you His true character. It shows you that there are reasons you should fear His rod. So an effect the word has on you is fear. The Bible makes sin appear exceeding sinful. It shows you how God does not like your sin and that you should be fearful to fall in the hands of a living God. It shows a, The Bible shows a lost man hell. It shows a saved man the chastening hand of God and the potential of leaving naked at the judgment seat of Christ. Another effect of the written word is faith. Hebrews 4, 2 says, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So what is this talking about exactly? It is referring to Israel when they were supposed to go in to possess the promised land of Canaan. They sent spies over to spy out the land, but the spies came back and scared Israel out of taking the land. They didn't have faith in the gospel that was preached to them. So the word preached didn't profit them. This gospel isn't like the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection. This is the gospel of military warfare. The glad tidings they heard was that they need to go in and possess the land, and the Lord would have given them victory over the giants. But they didn't believe. There is more than one gospel in the Bible. 
And the word gospel isn't limited to the gospel you believe to get eternal life. Gospel means glad tidings. Uh, the more you read the Bible, the more faith you're going to have. Uh, it's a lot easier to believe a promise from someone you know. Do you know God? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? If you have a hard time believing the promises of God, you should read the Bible more and get to know God. That way you'll be more likely to believe the promises. Many people don't have faith in God because they don't know Him. They haven't spent enough time with Him. Romans ten seventeen. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So an effect of the written Word is faith. Hebrews 4, 3. For we which have believed do enter into his rest. Do enter into rest, as he said. As I have sworn in my wrath, that they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. In verse 3, you have the believer's rest. This is our rest. Those which have believed have entered into the believer's rest the moment they believed. For unto us was, this, was the gospel preached. The Gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. If you have put your trust on Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross to pay your sin debt, then you have been born again and entered into rest. For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So the Lord has had a rest available from the foundation of the world. He rested the seventh day. It was not because he was sleepy from creating. God doesn't get tired. But see, an effect of the written word is rest. Hebrews 4.4 4 says, For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. You read back in the book of Genesis, God ended his work and rested on the seventh day. But today, Jesus Christ is our rest, and his word will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Isaiah 26, 3 says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is set on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Hebrews 4, 5, and 6, And then this place again, and they shall enter into my rest. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. So the children of Israel wouldn't enter into the rest of the promised land. But you get in this rest by believing the gospel. Then your walk in the flesh enters into his rest when you yield yourself to the Holy Spirit, walking by faith. Without that, it's impossible to please him. But another effect of the written word is that will it, it will soften your heart. You'll be softened. Hebrews 4, 7, again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. So those people wouldn't enter into his rest because of a hard heart, a heart that wouldn't believe the words and hear his voice. When you open the Bible with a believing heart, you will get softened up. It will soften you up when it comes to your sin. Romans 7, 13 says, It was then that which is good and made death unto me, God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. So it will soften you up when you read about hellfire. You will begin to have a heart for those around you that are going to, to that horrible place it will soften you up when it comes to putting others first just like jesus christ did romans 15 3 says for even christ pleased not himself but as it is written the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me so you see it will soften you up it will show you need to be kind to other people you need to put other people first you need to be worried about you know your eternal soul, and not just this temporary life. So what everybody's concerned about today is their temporary life that's like a vapor. It's here for a little time, but it's just going to vanish away. 
the Bible will soften you up to these facts. The next thing, another effect of the written word is excitement. Hebrews 4, 8 says, For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. Notice here the Holy Spirit shows you that Joshua is a type of Jesus Christ. Joshua had his conquests, and these picture Jesus Christ and his conquests at the future second coming. Joshua didn't give the people rest, and that is why the Lord spoke of another day. In Hebrews 4, 9, it says, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. An effect of the written word is excitement. It gives you something to look forward to. And this refers to the millennial rest. Here in verse 9, We have already entered into the believer's rest, but one day we will enter the millennial kingdom. And if you think about it, and you really believe it, that ought to make you excited. This should give you something to look forward to and live for. It should keep you excited about something. But notice how the Bible replaces Joshua's name with Jesus. It's flat out showing you that Joshua was a, just a picture of Jesus. And Jesus is, the, is the, the name you see in the New Testament for Joshua. But another effect of the written word is motivation. Hebrews 14 through 11, For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So we obviously don't labor to enter into the believer's rest. However, someone will labor to enter into the millennial rest. The tribulation saints will have to endure unto the end without taking the mark of the beast. That is going to be a labor. He's going to have to believe that the Lord will take care of him without going into the world system to survive. That way they don't fall after the same example of unbelief like the children of Israel did in the wilderness. So born again believers today aren't laboring to enter into a rest, but we should be motivated to labor anyway. This way, when we get into the millennial kingdom, we will have more reign with the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll have more rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. Another effect of the written word is confidence. Confidence because the word of God is the greatest weapon. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is quick, which means alive and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So notice the word quick. This doesn't mean fast. It means the word of God is alive. Notice the definition for quick is given in Numbers chapter 16. If you look at Numbers 16, 30 through 33, you'll see how the Bible defines its own words. It says, But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth and swallow them up, with all that appertaining to them, and they go down quick, there's that word, they go down quick into the pit. Then you shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And it came to pass he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them. And the earth opened her mouth, and swallowed them up in their houses, and all the men that appertained unto Korah and all their goods. They and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit. And the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. So it says, they go down quick into the pit in verse 30. And then it says, they went down alive into the pit. So you see, quick means alive. Notice another part of the Bible gives you the same definition. 1 Peter 4, 5 says, Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? If you're not dead, you're alive. Ready to judge the quick and the dead. So the word of God is quick, it's alive, and it's powerful. That is why Paul tells Timothy to preach the word. And the preaching you hear today greatly lacks the word. But that is where the power is at. It's in the word. It is also sharper than any two-edged sword. It's like that dagger that Ehud used to stab King Eglon with. 
Psalms 149.6 says, Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. So you need to handle the sword like one of David's mighty men. In 2 Samuel 23.9-10, it says, And after him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with David. When they defied the Philistines that were there, gathered together to battle, and the men of Israel were gone away, he arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary. Now notice this, and his hand clave unto the sword, and the Lord wrought a great victory that day, and the people were turned after him only to spoil. So the sword is what you use to fight the devil, and your hand should cleave unto the sword, just like one of David's mighty men. Ephesians 6, 17 says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So the same sword that Jesus Christ will use at the second coming is the same sword you can hold in your hand. Revelation 19, 15 says, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So the the sword is the word of God, and you have it. So Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is quick and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So notice the verse makes a distinction between the spirit, the soul, and the body. Your spirit was made alive the moment you believed the gospel. God took the sword and circumcised your soul from your fleshy body and quickened your spirit. And that's the spiritual circumcision. In Colossians 2, 11 through 13, you see one of the greatest doctrines of salvation in the Bible that nobody ever talks about. It's probably my favorite one. And I think it's the key to believing eternal security is the spiritual circumcision Colossians 2, 11 through 13 says, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So you went from dead to alive. You went from uncircumcised spiritually to spiritually circumcised. And that cut your soul loose from your flesh. So now when you sin in the flesh, none of those sins are applied to your soul like they were before you got saved. It's cut loose. It doesn't apply to it anymore. See, before you got saved, your flesh was stuck to your soul. And so your soul had all the effects of, uh, had all the sin applied to it, like it. And that's why you would have went to hell, because you had those sins on your soul. Now that you're saved, they're not on your soul. So God sees your soul sinless and righteous, just like Jesus Christ. So since your soul was cut loose from your flesh, and your spirit is quickened, this means your soul will spend eternity with Jesus Christ. And at death, your soul will go to the third heaven. Your spirit will go back to God and your body will go back to the dust. A lost man's soul goes to hell. His spirit, the lost man's spirit goes back to God. His soul's in hell, so he's suffering. His body goes in the grave back to the dust. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God is a discerner of the evil motives of the heart. It knows who is dishonest and insincere when handling the word. When you're reading it, it reads you. Hebrews 4.13 says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Notice this is still talking about the Word. And God is giving the Word attributes that God has. The Word is how God lets us get to know Him. So, an effect, another effect of the written Word is also thankfulness. When you read the Bible and realize that Jesus Christ did for you what He did for you, even though you're a sinner, it will make you thankful. Hebrews 4.14 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, 
Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. So Jesus Christ is the great high priest that passed into the heavens. He lived a sinless life. He died by shedding his blood on the cross for your sins. He was buried and resurrected. He traveled faster than the speed of light through the first and second heaven into the third heaven and applied the blood up there for me and you. That is Jesus, the Son of God, who is God manifest in the flesh. That is the profession of our faith. And if you have believed from the heart, you are a possessor of salvation. As a born-again believer in the body of Christ, I'm going to be with Jesus Christ, whether I hold fast my profession or not. But the trib saints are going to have to hold fast their profession to enter into his millennial rest. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So we have an high priest that was touched with every feeling of our infirmities. He was poor. He got tired. He got cold. He got hungry. He faced persecution. He felt pain. And he did all voluntarily for me and you. He was tempted of the devil for me and you. He was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So we are tempted and we sin. He was tempted and never sinned. And if you really get into the word and you see what the Lord Jesus Christ did for you, coming down the earth, leaving his home in heaven, coming to earth for, you know, he was rich before our sex, he became poor. That should make you thankful. And that's an effect of the written word. And another effect of the written word is prayer. Hebrews 4.16, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So if you're saved, then you have access to talk to God 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. And the word of God will remind you to pray and reveal how you have access to talk to the creator of the universe. We come to God for mercy and grace to make it through each day. We come to God and pray confessing our sins not to get saved or to stay saved, but to stay in fellowship. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 Thessalonians five seventeen says, Pray without ceasing. We come boldly to the throne of grace. Just go straight to God and make a request. As it says in Philippians 4, 6, Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. This is a throne of grace you are approaching. So don't neglect to ask for something just because you think you don't deserve it. Because you don't deserve it. That is why is it a th it's a throne of grace. Grace is God giving you something that you don't deserve. If you're in a mess, then don't neglect to ask for help. Just because you think you deserve to stay in the mess doesn't mean you have to stay in the mess. It's a throne of grace. You do deserve to stay in the mess. But it's a throne of grace that you go to to obtain mercy. If God is, is giving you mercy, then he is getting you out of something you do deserve. So you do deserve to be in the mess. But he, he's giving you a way out. And what you deserve is pain, sorrow, agony, and hell. But pray that you obtain mercy. But an effect of the written word is prayer. So pray to God about everything. Even about little things. And just start your day out right with prayer and with the written word.